Thank you so much, Jenna. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, like Jenna said, this is gonna be our first installment into a new series called Paces Connection Reacts. And this is where we will take um, the time to actually look into a lot of different things like conferences or current events and really um, look at them through a Paces lens, through a trauma-informed lens. And I think that it's important for us to do this not, be, not only because um, there's so much going on in the world right now that relates to PACES, but also adding a perspective to even current events and seeing how um, all of these different current events along with conferences and new science and you know, things that are happening on the news, um, being able to kind of interpret them in a way that allows us to have a better understanding of PACES science. And so today we're going to look at the HOPE Summit uh, and which was uh, their first annual HOPE Summit. And I think that this was a great uh, opportunity to really kind of launch our understanding of PACES science as we look at both positive and adverse childhood experiences. Um, for me personally, it's been a bit of a, a struggle because I must admit that when I attended, um, I had to kind of reflect on myself and how I often put too much emphasis on adversity in my work and don't give enough um, focus and effort into uh, PCEs and resilience. And so we've gathered today staff and hopefully those of you who attended the HOPE Summit as well to kind of reflect on the summit and look forward to what it means for our movement, uh, what it means for ACEs initiatives and how we can move forward in a real way and incorporate um, positive childhood experiences into our existing work on ACEs. And so I have um, with me, Allison and Natalie, who also attended the, um, the event. And we're gonna really just kind of talk through our experiences. Um, and so I'll go first. <laughs> uh, I, like I said, when I attended, I, was, um, I had to self-reflect. And so I always talk about how naturally pessimistic I am and um, how I really do focus most of my work on trauma and ACEs and specifically historical trauma and how systems uh, of oppression are impacting people. And uh, I don't give enough effort and thought or, or even really uh, being able to look at the science of positivity and hope and so I had to kind of self-reflect and think through how my work needed to have more balance uh, and how, you know, when I talk and when I uh, reach out to people and even in the um, events, educational events that I craft and that I have to have a more balanced approach because when we think about uh, the PACES movement, PCEs are really the, you know, it's the next step. So as we become trauma-informed, what does it mean to address trauma in a real way? It's going to be um, creating or crafting positive experience for people, not just children, but also adults, and that those positive experiences um, really help to bolster their resilience, but also to um, you know, look at it from a scientific standpoint. Um, it is really long-term helping them to build their own resilience. Um, to learn how to create positive uh, experiences for themselves. Uh, and then ultimately having uh, community support around positive experiences, even when we get into kind of the built environment. And so there's so much there. And so I thought that it was a great conference. I really love the, um, you know, beyond the science aspects of it as a psychology professor, I'm very familiar with that. Um, I really love the personal touches and the personal stories. Um, and so I attended, well, what I most liked about the conference had to be uh, Reverend Daryl Armstrong. Uh, I'm doing that from memory, so I hope I got his name right. Um, I loved his story and how he talked about the people that touched his life. And I definitely appreciated um, the DNA of Hope Session uh, that really was able to kind of um, incorporate a real understanding of this, the formula of positivity and how we get that across in our work in a real way. Um, Allison or Natalie, did you guys have anything that really stood out for you um, as you attended the, the HOPE Summit? Um, 
I guess I just wanted to say in response and maybe like throw out a little bit of a question to audience members to respond to in the chat. And then I would love to hear what um, one of our guests here, Dr. Christina Bethel. And we also have um, Jeff Linkenbach who did the DNA session here um, on the call. So I'd love to hear their responses as well as anyone's thoughts in the chat, but hearing your reflections and needing to integrate more positivity into your work. I couldn't help but think how I came from it, came to this work in the opposite way. And I'm just wondering if other people resonate, but I think this may have to do with being a Californian, but I very much had um, this new term called toxic positivity. Does anyone else, has anyone else heard that term? It's kind of a buzzword right now. And so I actually was a public speaker um, on the topics of kindness and gratitude. And I've written blogs in the Huffington Post and I've spoken on stage in cities around the world on kindness and gratitude. And then I had an emotional meltdown and I had to actually look at my ACEs and I had to figure out how to heal. And so it's interesting for me because I'm like, how do we do the positivity work while still acknowledging that how important it is to look at the abuse and the trauma? And um, however, I will say, and I just want to throw that question out to anyone who relates. I came to it from the positivity side first, which, which had a somewhat toxic impact on my life because I was really ignoring the, the stuff that was hurting. Um, however, since we changed our name, since, since we switched direction, I have become more hopeful about the work that we're doing. So I'm noticing an immediate impact, a positive impact on my mental health. So, um, Curious to hear anyone put their response in the chat um, and hear from some of our other folks. Thanks, Allison. What about you, Natalie? Natalie, you are a new staff person and really your focus is really on PCs and resilience. So I'm, I'm interested to hear your takeaway from the yeah. conference. Yeah, so I'm happy to share. So um, I come from the child abuse prevention field and public health and um, and I'm really excited about the HOPE framework. And you know, as soon as I saw it, I felt like it's, it's definitely where the field needs to be right now in a lot of ways. Um, and I was thrilled to see all of the people at the HOPE Summit um, living and breathing this new paradigm shift as, um, as Bob Sage said it. Um, and I, I also was inspired to hear about how HOPE is spreading. And one of the, a couple of things that I wanted to reflect on, one is that I just, I really appreciate the overlap. And I think this happens in the ACEs field too, but it's great to see it now in the PACES field um, of so many disciplines coming together, looking at medicine, education, psychology, relational health, um, public health, looking at policy, research, practice. It's really not just taking it in one direction, which I really appreciate that sort of um, pulling together. And I, I also really liked that Bob um, Sege even talked about the fact that the integration of the HOPE model is actually a part of the social ecology. And he really was acknowledging that we need a lot of different models um, to support children and families at different levels. He talked about HOPE at the child level, the strengthening families framework at the family level, help me grow at the community, um, and essentials for childhood at the policy and cultural. And that modeling working together and that synergy, I think is just, you know, also looking at ACEs, like we pull, we're pulling together a lot of pieces that I think have been in disparate places, to be honest. And so one of the things that I really love is seeing all these things coming together in paces. Um, and I think, I think one of the, um, the, the thoughts that Daryl Armstrong had that I just so resonated with was when he was talking about the definitions of hope and really thinking about how hope has this future orientation. Mm -hmm. And I thought of that just as such a great metaphor for the way that the field has gone. While we all need to understand and really grasp the profound impact of ACEs, just like you were saying, Allison, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think hope also lies in the question of what do we do with that information? And I think there have been a lot of people who said, and now what? Um, just as Ingrid was kind of uh, talking about too. And so how do we move forward? How do we prevent ACEs, which we know is paramount? How do we also promote PCAs? How do we promote healing and resilience and, and really pull all of that together? So I think my biggest takeaway is just, I'm so thrilled that we're seeing all these pieces from different um, sectors coming together and really uh, all working together in a, in a new way. So that would be my <laughs> big takeaway. 
Thank you, Natalie. And yeah, I think, you know, the definitely the multi-sector approach is so important. And that really kind of um, is a segue into the work that Dr. Bethel uh, talked about in the in the HOPE Summit was really focused on research and policy and practice. And so um, I really want to uh, give some time for Dr. Bethel to talk about, um, especially the policy aspect, um, along with just kind of the overall reflection on, on what incorporating um, PCs and resilience in a real way into the ACES movement, what does that look like for our trajectory? Great. Well, I want to really base a few comments I'm going to make, and I'm assuming I'll just take a couple minutes and then maybe Jeff will talk and we'll keep talking. But just to be responsive to what has already been said is that, you know, I talk about the dual continuum of health, which is that we can flourish and have adversity at the same time. And in fact, most people who have adversity have many qualities of flourishing, which are kind of meant, made up of meaning and purpose and participation and engagement in life, having relationships with people, positive relationships, seeking out and noticing the positive and not being afraid to immerse in positivity, even in the midst of adversity is maybe one of the hardest parts because our identity when we have adversity can get so caught up there, but we can still allow what is pleasant and what is connecting, which is often how we're connecting with other people about what's hard. So this, par this paradox that the way we experience positivity is often about sharing what we're what's vulnerable and difficult in a caring context, that that becomes the positivity and that they're not separate. They're actually embedded within each other and that populations with a lot of adversity often show the most flourishing and resilience in some ways and that doesn't mean we don't have to mitigate and eliminate what has led to that adversity in terms of social structures and racism and all of that, but the way to leverage the positive that already exists as a way to create the movement for that. So the dual continuum is really real where people can be very sick, they have a lot of adversity and by addressing that, by bringing our strength to that, we actually create positive experiences. And so I think that's a dilemma, but there's also the pitfall of toxic positivity, which is, you know, just buck up and grin and bear it, which is actually uh, gaslighting and demoralizing and abusive. And so we are not talking about that. And that often happens. Uh, where, well, they did better than you. So, well, the truth is, is people who look like they're doing better than someone else who have adversity had either something different happen or they're, they're masking <laughs> because we're humans and we're all humans the same. And the safe, stable, nurturing relationships and love and connection that we need biologically and to matter are built within us. And when those go awry, we suffer and have adversity. And so the solution to the prevention, the healing and the mitigation is the same thing as it's the opposite. You know, it is in some ways the, the taking away of that. And I would just say that adversity is, um, arises from a deeper knowing that something is right and something is true that didn't happen. And so underneath every adversity is what I call the finding the jewel concept, which is if I go deep enough, why is this hard for me? Well, it's because I know what's right. I know respect and honoring and mattering and being connected to is right and good. That didn't happen. So it's, it's experienced as a negative. And so underneath every experience of negativity and adversity and ACEs is a right and true knowing about what we want. And if we focus on that knowing, it will actually open up resources and ideas and the willingness maybe to reach out to restore that positive capacity but oftentimes basis comes with a shutting down, a survival mode. And if we don't bring in the positive possibilities, it can actually lead to not really even taking up the opportunities to the healing. And we know that's a huge issue is the not participating in what's even available to support healing and restoring that will to be well. So I'm just gonna stop right there, but the policy piece, I have a whole conversation about what this means for you know, designing programs, paying for programs, realigning performance measurements, credentialing and criteria, making sure that we allow people who have the skills to build flourishing and positive experiences enter into the workforce, be paid and get supported because that's often the gap for a lot of providers is I don't have those skills or I need someone to come in and teach me 
this. And those aren't necessarily licensed professionals. They can be family members. So there's a lot of policy issues that cut across um, you know, how we define care, pay for care, reward for things. And um, those are very big policy issues that I can come back to a little bit more if we want to talk about it. Yeah, and we can definitely loop back around and talk more about policy. And, and definitely what you said about gaslighting definitely resonated with me because so much of um, maybe not in this circle because we are kind of in a bubble in our work. But when we think about, you know, your everyday person, we are kind of pushed around this toxic uh, positivity um, when people are um, hurting or in need. And we talk about, well, you know, um, be grateful for what you have, or um, we basically um, don't acknowledge or validate their feelings. And this is something that happens with, you know, any anybody that's experiencing adversity. But then also when we think about on a larger scale, when we get to uh, systems of oppression, so um, people of color, um, their, their experiences not being validated is what right. resonates with me with gaslighting. It makes me okay. um, definitely resonate with what you're saying around that understanding um, that we have as people of color, that's very clear that, you know, my experience isn't being validated. Right. Uh, and and how that can you know that is a that is re-traumatizing people and it's right. not just people of color it's anyone dealing with any overwhelming social issue poverty yeah. um, childhood uh, abuse all of that and so I I definitely resonate with what you're saying uh, and I know that you talked about um, let's see uh, Dr. Linkenbach I hope I'm not butchering your name as well <laughs> um, I I attended your session and I really loved your your framework around spirit, science, action, return. And so um, I would love for you to talk about um, the Hope Summit and also how you see the um, ACES movement moving forward as we incorporate um, hope and positivity. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I was, I honestly was just coming in to listen today. So uh, just listening <laughs> to all of you. And <laughs> Listening to um, colleague uh, Christy, Dr. Bethel, I just wanted to come in and listen, but I, um, it's it's an honor to um, for you to ask me. So, um, yeah, the couple things I, um, I I'll jump off of some of what what Christy was saying and, and and Ingrid, some of what what you were asking. I think there's this Christy. I like the term the the dual continuum. You know that, and and I think there's if. Um, at the risk of really oversimplifying public health, that, that's what public health always does at its best, I, I think, is that it, it looks at risk and protection. It looks for gaps. It looks for the friction places, right? And so, Ingrid, to jump off it, I, I think your question is great. What, what does this look like for, for ACEs, for healing, for PACEs? I think we need both. I think we need both. I um, I like to think of the the positive maybe you know symbolized as as a green upward arrow. What is it that we seek to grow? What is it that we want to see in terms of the whole language and narrative in terms of flourishing and and making room to to create and expand? And, and we could look at um, the red downward arrow maybe as the the risks and the harms. Um, the, the toxins that that um, oppressions that that occur, and I and I think at a basic level we're 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 looking at the relationship between those two, and it's not one or the other. And in fact, um, at a real practical level, when we're talking about policy and communication and, and narratives, I think our most powerful examples always weave those together. I, I think the CDC is phenomenal at this. So whenever they, they're gonna roll something out, they're gonna speak about a hope and they're gonna speak about a concern side by side, or it may be the other way around. And there's different, strategically, there's different reasons why we'd put one in front of the other. But um, there's always that that hope of, of what could be better. What, what is there that, that is wanting greater expression? And there, at the same time, there, there's a concern of some of the factors that might be inhibiting that um, and, and or diminishing that. And so I'm really interested in, in the friction places where these, these come together and the, and the tensions. For us, 
individually in our own healing um, with, with ACEs, for example, what, what is it in me at times where I um, am, am afraid to allow that positive to express, right? Sometimes it might be easier for me to lead with a wound, um, right? And, 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 or stay stuck in, and, and forgive me with the term, but a trauma drama, right? I could get stuck in that because it's very familiar for me. Um, and at times that I, I may have to look at where the, the courage or the vulnerability of, of allowing that, that beauty or that positivity to come forth without that being toxic, Ingrid, as, as you're saying, which could be shutting down and, and be harmful yeah. as well. So I think this applies as well at the policy level. And I'll just kind of end with that by saying, I think at the policy level, we need to create the conditions that can honor both create the conditions to allow that the, the conversation to be happening to, to enrich both. And, and I think that's, um, th that's what I'm excited about with, with your question about what's that next frontier for, for ACEs and how does hope and, and PCEs contribute? I, that's what I'm interested in. And that's what I want to uh, want to explore it at, at different levels. Yeah. So. And if, if Jeff, I can talk more, yeah. more about this sort of, um, intimacy between adversity and positivity you know there's some studies and jane knows about this and many people on this call like with um treatment of addiction by you know looking at the fact that it's ritualized compulsive self-soothing which is kind of what they call it and that the first thing you say is isn't it wonderful that you care enough about yourself to not want to be in pain and i know you're in pain and i want to see it and that is love and action and that's positive experiences. And so literally the sharing of what's difficult, embraced with care is the positive experience. And when you ask people to think on that,